Hello, my name is Hallo. I'm from the Irish Software Engineering Research Centre at Nero. I can see you have heard of it. I'm going to try and persuade you of the importance of measurement and, in particular, of measuring product quality in software engineering. Would anybody dispute that statement? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, Give names of people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll lock them up. But there are there are some people who would who would say that it's that it's so difficult as to almost be impossible. Um, oh, I, I know a simple quality that I want on my software: mathematical correctness. Ah, okay. I'm going to lose you as an ally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I say, a, I know of one. That could be many others. That, yes, many others. I'm specifically interested in the internal qualities of software. This means the code, what happens when you lift up the bonnet and look inside. I am, of course, uh, aware of a huge amount of research on the correctness of software and the suitability of software to its requirements, but I am talking specifically about the ability to change the software to meet future requirements which are unknown at design time. And I'm going to argue there is no perfect design, evolution is inevitable, and that Software is especially prone to evolve. Um, I'm going to use some case studies from other areas of engineering to convince you of the importance of internal product quality. Uh, my first case study will be the famous Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster of 1940. And uh, then I want to talk about, finish with a more positive case study, which is the uh, development of uh, measurements for flying qualities of aircraft uh, in the U.S. between uh, 1919 and 1941. So, so you are a, a student of the guy who spent 10 years from Canada at Lima or previously. Did he really spend time at uh, at Langley? No, no, well, he did. He came from Canada to stay with at Lima for several years. What was his name? Um, the right or wrong? Oh, Dave Parnas. Dave Parnas. David Lord Parnas. He left before I arrived. Yeah. Sadly. He, he, he's one of the people be, be behind the man I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Let me warn you, how long? 15 minutes is what you have. <laughs> <laughs> no, we okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing that by a proxy. I've run quickly by the, uh, um, through the software evolution, evolution arguments. Uh, firstly, customers don't often know what they want. Uh, I love this phrase co coined by Barry Beam. I'm not sure, but I'll know it when I see it. That's what your typical customer <laughs> says, especially when faced with anything that has a user interface. Um, so you have to build it first, usually. There is no such thing as a perfect design. The problems of multiple users or changing <coughs> fashion or new aesthetics will always be lying in wait. Henry Petrosky is a nice writer who writes about all kinds of engineering. Here he was talking about water pitchers, not software. These are the white plastic jugs that you put in your fridge and have a carbon filter in them. Um, turns out that the designs of water pitchers have to evolve to take into account changing fashions, designs of carbon filters, changing shapes of fridges, changing designs of sinks, taps, and faucets. You cannot escape the world around you as soon as you're designing a product. Finally, if there is going to be variation, that variation is almost certainly going to be in the software. Um, for example, we were actually mentioning this earlier, but most car manufacturers now offer engines with different characteristics. Frequently, these engines differ only in the software of the car engine controller. And in the hardware, price. you need Sorry. And the price. Mm -hmm. The price, <laughs> yes. In hardware, you need to achieve economies of scale, and this is why manufacturers will push the variation into the software controller where they can. So it is desirable to measure the evolvability of a software product. There have been many, many attempts. Large number of models, not much evidence backing up these models, and there doesn't seem to be any consensus. I've... Uh, this is one of the first attempts that I know of, uh, McCall's model of 1977. Um, this is an excerpt from an enormous paper which is full of diagrams like this. The attributes of quality that he says are relevant to, um, to evolvability would be maintainability and flexibility. But 
the level of detail here is insufficient to enable measurement and is insufficient, insufficient to, the, to enable prediction. Um, for example, measuring modularity, how, how is that not measurable? There would need to be a significant further expansion of the tree here. And of course we've got further problems in that it's not a tree. Modularity has appeared twice. Is this the same modularity as before? This is a very difficult subject. Um, there have been attempts to standardize that have been, as far as I can tell, mostly ignored. Then other famous authors have chipped in with their opinions. The situation is a big mess. Um, for when, when I'm looking at, I'm interested in the history of engineering. That's an upfront confession. The, in many branches of engineering, the papers are actually very readable. But unfortunately, researchers in other engineering disciplines rarely mention epistemology or research methodology at all. They're paradigmatic sciences. Engineering is normal design. They, it, it's taken as a given how you will um, solve a certain problem or how you will achieve a certain result. So they're not mentioned. This means you have to search out authors that will help you with the, if you like, higher level analysis. Two books I like by Henry Petrosky, and my special favorite is Walter Vincenti's book, What Engineers Know and How They Know It, which is where the aircraft, design, aircraft comes from. I think everyone in this room, if you haven't read that book, would love it. <laughs> when I'm right, get it, it's great. <laughs> so to the case studies, uh, it's very well known that in 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was built and promptly collapsed. <coughs> it was a two-lane road suspension bridge over the Puget Sound, it had a 2,800 foot span, which was the third longest in the world at the time. That is, so it wasn't actually pushing the boundaries in terms of how long a bridge can I build. However, it was built on a tight budget. The design was ambitiously economical. Uh, 1930 structural engineering theory suggested that, given ordinary steel, it was perfectly possible to build a bridge of this type to a span of nearly four and a half thousand feet. And by the late 1930s, with stronger steel materials, they thought the theoretical limit was approaching 10,000 feet. That's enormous. Petrosky would say they were massively overconfident. Anyway, this bridge was built. It had some, it exhibited small structural problems even before its completion. Then it collapsed due to an unexpected effect. And I have a showing the movie. I have, I'm going to show you one of the many movies. On that bridge. What, yes, there, there, there are loads. Check them out. They're great. Um, so this is the bridge on its opening day. And note the galloping Gertie motion, which you will see in the next frame. Yes. This bridge is galloping. <laughs> This motion was known, and it, this motion was possibly even known by the Romans. The theory accounted for this, but because of the level of susceptibility, Professor Bert Farkerson from the University of Washington was brought in as a consultant just a few days after the bridge's opening to see what could be done. Now, Professor Bert Farkerson is this guy in the middle. <laughs> Wandering along the center line. I'm pretty sure, not from this, from other camera angles. Did he survive? Yes. Uh, the only casualty was a dog called Tubby. I knew someone would ask that. And on the left hand side, you'll see a strange pillar with red and white markings and a black cross piece at the top. And further strange red and white objects here attached to lamp poles and at purpose-made poles at intervals. You'll notice them only on the left-hand side, not on the right-hand side of the bridge. These are measuring instruments. The first thing Professor Farkerson did was attach measuring instruments to the side of the bridge. But he was only expecting a galloping motion along the bridge, so he only attached them to one side. On the morning of the 7th of November, in the strongest wind that the bridge had to date and encountered, the bridge started to do something different. Yes. which is move a torsional yes. motion. And this uh, torsional motion ha had not been predicted. The wow. bridge was evacuated. The torsional motion grew in intensity and 
In a few seconds' time, you'll see about $3 million, which in 1940 was a huge amount of money being wasted. And um, Ferguson was the last person on the bridge. This man was uh, an obsessive. He was dedicated to his craft. Anyway, thanks to the intervention of Professor Farquharson, this has become one of the most studied engineering disasters in history. It took him about 10 years. So you, you've, you've seen the good bit. It took him about 10 years, but the conclusion he and his colleagues came to was that the collapse was due to aeroelastic fluttering. And this is an effect where you have a flat member in a steady airflow and the flat member is um, elastic in a torsional dimension. This effect was well understood by that time in a completely different branch of engineering. This had already been observed in aircraft wings and it was a known problem for aircraft designers, uh, particularly of monoplanes. So the surprising conclusion is that humanity knew about this aeroelastic fluttering problem this was not incorporated into bridge design theory, and the overconfident bridge engineers thought that they could build bridges much longer than this one. <coughs> Cautionary tale. Moving on to my second example. Um, this is an experimental laboratory. In about 1917, the uh, US, aware of coming war in Europe, started to ramp up their efforts to build military aircraft. Uh, this spawned a huge scientific effort based at Langley Field in Virginia. You can already see a huge amount. This, is, uh, this picture is, I think, dates from 1920. Uh, you can already see that a huge amount of money has been spent on this facility. Um, there are something like 13 or 14 aircraft in shot. There are mechanics tending to these aircraft. Uh, this is even before they built a huge tarmac apron. Uh, there were hangars. That, I don't even know what the airship is doing in the background. This is uh, money spent in the name of experimental science. One of the many problems they were trying to solve was, can we predict from the drawing board what an aircraft would be like to fly? It was very common for a designer to sketch out an aircraft, for an aircraft to be built, for a brave or crazy test pilot to take this plane into the air to discover that it was lethal to just about land it, and then the engineers would chop off the tail section and build a complete new tail for this aircraft. Obviously this is a huge risk and it was very expensive. But to us to be able to predict the flying qualities of aircraft, we need to know what does flyability mean. And one of their experimental programs, one of their experimental programs set out to try and determine this. They tested dozens of aircraft in two phases from about 1919 to 1923, and then again from about 1938 to 1941. The experiments divided into two phases because it seems that the flying qualities took a back seat to other uh, properties of aircraft that were perceived to be more important. Um, in, in, addition, in addition to flight tests, there were ground experiments on pilots. They built rigs in which pilots would be seated and the forces the pilots exerted on the controls at various orientations were measured rigorously. And in order to allow these same forces that exerted by pilots on the controls to be measured in flight, uh, they quickly moved on from a system where the pilot recorded measuring instruments on a pad balanced on his knee whilst in a steep spiral dive and um, to develop some uh, really quite amazingly innovative measurement instruments. These included optical recorders, uh, spring gauges, and I think this, it may be the first, it's certainly one of the first instances of photographic film being recorded, being used to record the change with time of these values, and of uh, time synchronization codes being used to link data together from different photographic films used to monitor different measuring instruments. A lot of people were against this test program. People said, we shouldn't do it. Once we've done this test program, these results are going to be written down in an enormous book, and they were written in a huge book. The book specified the movements, 
of an aircraft and the forces on the controls that would be needed to create those movements by the aircraft. Manufacturers in particular said, if we write this book, it will become a standard and we will be stuck with it. The effort was opposed, but once the book was written, it was distilled down into, well, more or less one sentence. That the important criterion for flyability of an aircraft is the stick force per G. And anyone who knows modern aeronautical engineering will think, well, of course, this is obvious, right? You push the stick harder if you want to do a tighter <coughs> turn. Uh, but prior to these experiments, they didn't know this. So this is a positive message in that we have to go through a huge amount of pain, very expensive experiments, a horrible long book, and then some smart people come along and tease out the essentials, and there you have the theoretical work. So, last slide. Uh, these are what I think are the implications of those case studies. For the first case study, a thorough understanding of product qualities is vital. Uh, if you think you've understood product quality, but you haven't, there's going to be a disaster. Second case study, gaining that understanding of product quality might be difficult. It could cost many millions of euros, but it should be possible. Complex socio-technical phenomena, such as the interaction between a highly trained pilot and his aircraft, can be quantified. It just takes a lot of work. Development of measures and measuring instruments makes it tractable. If the pilots had still been up there with a pencil and a paper pad trying to record values on their knees, they would probably still be up there right now. Final point, this is an example of empirical research leading theory. Without the empirical research to generate the huge volume of data, the theory would never have been extracted. Thank you very much. Thank you.